All right, guys, it's great to be back here with you guys again. Um, hopefully, you're enjoying the fact that my face isn't huge and my head isn't huge on the screen, uh, which Connor, he said in the last sermon, he's like, Henty won't hear this. And I totally heard it. Yes, I do have a big head when I was on the screen when I was on video. So much, much more glad to be with you guys here in person uh, this evening. And so, um, yeah, th there's a bunch of things I want to say before I start. And so I'm just going to go down the list here. But um, I, one, I just wanted to say thank you to a bunch of people. So um, I, I've said this to them in private, and I wanted to say it to them in public. And I wanted you guys to uh, just cheer them on and applaud them as well. And so um, our, our high school team, so Hannah and Josh and Connor, as well as all of our life group leaders, did such an amazing job when I was gone. I didn't even have to worry about anything, which was a huge blessing uh, to me to be able to be with Sophia and to be with their family um, while they're in this difficult time. So can we just give a hand up for real quick for all of our leaders and for our HSM team? Um, it, it is such an honor and a blessing to be able to work uh, with them, and I'm glad that we just that we get to do all of this together. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to the senior girls for giving me this cup, which reads, a pastor like you is harder to find than toilet paper during a pandemic. So um, a very contextualized coffee cup that I have actually drank from, um, and it probably will only ever make sense to the people in this room. Um, one day my kids will be like, why on earth do you have a coffee cup like that? Um, and then I'll be like, well, let me tell you a story. And uh, we won't get into all of that. So uh, another kind of really weird but interesting thing uh, is that, uh, at least I, I wanted to get to see if someone would guess. Can anyone guess how many days it's been since I was in this room preaching to high school ministry? And if you guess correctly, so leaders, you can't guess, I'll give you a $5 Starbucks gift card, which can't actually buy you a whole drink at Starbucks anymore because Star like every, every, you can get like a tall, maybe like Pike you know, Place roast and it's probably not gonna be that great. What, what was your guess? 366 days. Uh, no, it's not. Do we have any more guesses? No. So someone, the question was, how many days has it been? Wow. Clearly, you guys, the seniors are listening. Bring it in, bring it in strong here. Um, how many days has it been since I last preached in this room to high school students? Do you have a guess? No, it hasn't been 28 days. No. <laughs> That's also a, a really bad zombie movie. No. <laughs> what, do you, what, do you go back in time? <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh, <laughs> I've never done it. That's also wrong. <laughs> 35. 35. Okay. Who said, who said, you, someone said 388. I'm just going to give that to you because no one's going to remember. Thank you very much. It's been, it's been 542 days since I last preached a sermon in this room to high school students. It was November 24th of 2000 and get this, 19. It's literally been like a year and six months. So I'm super pumped to be in this room and to be able to preach to you guys. Um, So the last, the last time I preached the sermon, it was on the topic of hell. Um, and so I'm much, I'm much, much gladder to be here uh, and to be able to talk about something a little bit more lighthearted, but probably just as serious uh, such as wisdom. And so uh, if you guys want to open up your Bibles to so Proverbs chapter 3, uh, that's where we're going to be tonight is in Proverbs chapter 3. And we are going to be looking at verses 5 and 6, which I'm sure if any of you guys have... If you live in a Christian household, you probably have a coffee cup with this verse on it. Uh, I remember when I was, I ran this passage by Connor, and I was like, what do you think of this? And he's like, really? You're going to preach on that? Like, everyone knows that verse. Um, and that, it's almost like a challenge. Like, yes, everyone knows it, but do we actually understand it? Um, and so uh, we're going to, what we're going to kind of do here uh, in, tonight is that we, we've been doing a couple of one-off sermons, obviously, because... I, I ended up dipping out of the country for a couple of weeks, and so we're going to do our Mosaic series in the fall, uh, and we're going to lengthen it out a little bit more. But we've been doing these one-off series, and I thought this would be a great moment. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's as good as a moment as, as, as any to pause and really to ask ourselves um, the, kind of a question before we jump into the next kind of couple of summer months where kind of the guardrails of schedule, and I'm sure as you guys love so much, online school kind of falls away. Um, your lives just eventually begin to kind of like fray out into disarray and you're like, you know, waking, going to bed at like 
3 or 4 a.m. in the morning and you're waking up at 12.30, which I know really brings a lot of joy and happiness into your parents' lives uh, when they're like, I've already been up for 12 hours and you're just waking up. Um, and, and so the, I think that the, this would be a good moment for us to kind of ask this question, what would it look like for us to navigate through this upcoming summer as well as kind of really the rest of your life? So that's kind of a big bracket there. Uh, but specifically this summer, how can we do that with wisdom? How can we do that in a way uh, that it, and, and what wisdom is, is in us making, it's us applying knowledge and truth and helping us then to make the right decisions about how to navigate through all the different challenges that are ahead of us. And so, in another way, this sermon's not going to just be about you know, me saying you should read your Bible over summer because you wouldn't like that and I wouldn't want to be the one having to preach a sermon like that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to unpack these verses and really grasp a hold of what wisdom is, what, what understanding is, and then how then we can then apply that at the very, very end uh, to our lives into the next couple of months. And I want to invite you uh, guys into a couple of things that are going to be going on uh, here in the summer. So the key to understanding of where we're going this evening uh, is this, this kind of sentence here. It's that wisdom always requires knowledge, but knowledge itself doesn't make us wise. So wisdom always requires knowledge, but knowledge itself doesn't make us wise. And I know maybe some of you guys are reading that and you're like, that's confusing. It's probably because it is. Um, but also, I think I'm going to give you guys a couple of examples and you're going to be able to see that this actually makes a lot of sense. And so, are any of you guys in biology right now? Okay, got a couple of hands. Um, and so, when you are in school and you're learning about biology, you're, you're learning about things like mitosis. When I said the word biology to my wife, she was like, mitochondria, like it was like some kind of like really cool name. And I was like, that's too, like, you need to, you need to calm down. Uh, I think she said it was something about like the, it's being like, what is it, the, the, the light? <laughs> that's exactly what she said to me, there we go. You can obviously tell the grade I got in biology. It was not a good one. Um, but we learn all these things in, in biology. We learn, learn all these things about our bodies. We learn about chromosomes. We talk about the differences that we have in our bodies as guys and girls. And now you're getting really scared because you're like, please don't go into anatomy and biology. And I won't. But what, but what we can see and understand about biology is that it gives us all this knowledge, this information about how God has beautifully and wonderfully created our bodies. But then comes the question when you're in your biology class and then there's the girl, the guy that you like, that you're in a group with, and then you're like, how do I talk to them? It is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and some people, they would be like, well, the answer is really simple, you don't. Um, or for some of you, you're like, okay, I'm going to try and make some really bad biology joke and see if I can strike up a conversation. But what we can see is that we, we get this knowledge and we get this information from taking a biology class that can, yes, make us smart, but it doesn't necessarily make us wise and able to necessarily navigate through having that conversation with the person that you like in your class. It's the same thing maybe for some of you guys who like English, you know, and which is probably actually none of you. Um, and so, you know, like maybe some, do we have any fan? Okay, Annabelle likes English. There we go. Another one. Okay. Okay. But like, you know, you're reading, uh, what's the book? But The Great Gatsby by, by whatever his name is, Fitzgerald, okay? And you're like, so someone said boo, just watch the movie, it's fine. Uh, you know, but like, you're, you're, you're taking this class and you're reading this literature and you're like, wow, this is amazing. And you're understanding and you're interpreting it and you're looking at all the images and all these things that are being used. And maybe you're an AP lit and you're reading like The Heart of Darkness and you're creeping into like the really dark, crazy places of people's hearts and all those kind of things. But then you get a text message from the person that you like or the person that you're interested in and it says, it's fine, period. <laughs> or, or just the letter K, period. And if you're a guy, you're like, eh, okay, it's fine. But if you're a girl, you know, you're like, no, everything's wrong. Like the world is burning down. The catastrophe is happening. And so what, even here, what we see is that you might have knowledge about English and about reading and about writing and about grammar, which probably most of you guys' grammar is bad because mine was terrible until I got into college. And I took a class on Greek and then somehow my English got better. That doesn't really make any sense. But anywho, we, we know all these different rules and these different things about English, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we understand how to communicate, that we can have wisdom to talk and to navigate through conversations with other people. We, so you, hopefully you guys, you can see here, there's this difference between knowledge, knowing things, and then what wisdom is. And so we can see here that this statement is true. Wisdom always requires knowledge. In order to be wise, we have to know something. But knowledge in and of itself doesn't actually make us wise. A good example is I just finished my master's degree. And even though I went through like 
10 years of school, if I didn't actually like apply God's word to my heart and my life while in Bible college and while in seminary, I, w- I would just be, I mean, I would probably be a guy that you guys, that I, I would just annoy all of you because I would just be rattling off like, oh, this, the solution to your sin and all this stuff is really simple, da, 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 all these things, but it's, it's, not, it's not filled with any wisdom, or with any insight in how to actually apply those things. And that's what we really need to understand as we kind of jump into this passage here tonight is that knowledge and wisdom are different, but God is calling us into a life of wisdom. And so the struggle, the reality that we face is that no one really wakes up and says like, yeah, like I want to be foolish. No one wakes up and says, yeah, I wanna be an idiot today. Like I hope none of you guys wake up and think that. If you do, let's chat afterwards. Um, but, but like no, no, one, no one wakes up thinking that. But then the question then comes, though, if, if we do, though, remain foolish, if we just maybe collect information but don't become wise, what, what ends up happening is that it actually becomes sinful. And when we just know things but we don't, know how to, we don't have wisdom of how to navigate through our lives, it actually ends up harming ourselves as well as harming other people. And so then we need to learn wisdom. And so the question that we're kind of posing tonight is How? How do we learn wisdom? How do we learn and and, and get understanding, biblical, godly understanding about how we are to navigate through our lives? And so let's read uh, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 here. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And so the way, the way that we can become wise and understanding is that we trust and we acknowledge God. Once again, the struggle that we face is that we struggle to connect this, what is knowledge to wisdom. And sometimes we, we miss how those two things piece together. And I think one of the things that makes us really difficult for us, and this is our first point, is that we live in a world of self-made wisdom. We live in a world of self-made wisdom. If you look at past, really in like the whole context of the book of Proverbs, we say that there's, there's many different kinds of people who are saying, follow me, do what I'm saying. And the way that the, the, the book of Proverbs kind of illustrates this whole point is that it gives this image of two different kinds of, of women. And so the first woman is, 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 she's called the woman of wisdom. And she, she cries out on the street. If you, if you, if you can, can, can turn over the page to Proverbs 1, verse 20, it says, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. And at the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. She says, How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? but she's not the only one who's crying out in this book for people to follow her. She's, she's inviting us to saying, you don't have to any longer be foolish. You can learn wisdom, but you need to follow the way of the Lord. But then there's this other woman in the book of Proverbs and she's called the forbidden woman. And if you, and if you go and you read through the book of Proverbs, what you're gonna see and understand is that this, this woman, it, it, she, and the, the idea that it's a woman, it's not like degrading women or anything like that, so let, let me just be clear about that, but this woman entices men and she entices people to come to her home and to lie in her bed and her one goal and desire is to, is to essentially to take them and to destroy their lives. She's described like, like a trap, like a snare that you would capture an animal in so that you could end its life. And so we live in a world that has, that, that's filled with self-made wisdom. We have lots of people like the like this forbidden person who are calling out on the street corners of our lives, which probably look a lot like our phones and the internet and what we're listening to who are crying out to us, follow me, come after me. The wisdom that I have is the wisdom that you should follow. And so then how then do we gain ears to be able to hear and to listen and to understand and to hear the voice of God, to hear the voice of reason, to hear the voice of wisdom in our lives in the middle of a world that has thousands and thousands of voices crying out to us for us to follow it. I mean, just for example, the reason why this is so difficult for us is because the way that news gets to us, I mean, it's, it's, it's in our pockets all the time. I mean, we, we don't even have to watch TV anymore. We can make it. 
We can put it on YouTube. We can put our opinions. We can go on Twitter, and you never had a voice before, but now we do. And, and, and all those things, it doesn't necessarily mean that knowledge is bad. It doesn't mean that social media is bad, but it means that there's a lot of voices in the world that are crying out for your attention and are saying, follow me, come after me, listen to me, and I will lead you to truth. But all, I would say almost 99% of those voices except for one, will only lead you to destruction and to despair and to a life separated from God. And there's only one voice, the voice of wisdom, the word Jesus who's calling out to us. It's only that voice that's actually going to give us the truth that we need to be able to navigate through life in a way that honors God, but that actually in a way that actually gives us meaning and lasting and eternal joy. And so what I don't want you guys to miss tonight is this fact, is that there's only one voice that we, that we should be listening to that's actually going to give us the kind of joy and meaning and satisfaction and purpose that we're looking for in the world around us. We're not going to find it in other things. So once again, knowledge is good. Knowledge is a good thing. The fact that we have the internet, that knowledge is so readily available, it's a good thing, but it's also a dangerous thing. But once again, knowledge, wallage, that would've been funny. Knowledge, in and of itself, it doesn't make us wise. God is the one who makes us wise. So what does this passage say then is the issue. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. And so the thing that is the problem, the problem is our understanding. Because sin has entered into our hearts and into our lives and into our minds as we see all the way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, our hearts are corrupted by sin our ability to understand and to make sense of the world around us is broken. And so why should we not lean on our own understanding? Well, for that reason, but also because the Bible says so. Once again, our hearts are sinful and deceitful. And so I want to take you to James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And it helps us to kind of take a small peek into kind of this, 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 this lack of understanding or this broken understanding that we have in our hearts and in our lives. And so if you want to turn over there with me, you, you can. And this is what James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18 has to say about wisdom. And so the, the, the way that we should, we should read this and understand this is this is a good way for us to look into our hearts. So this is a moment to look inside of our hearts and to ask the question, it, like, how can I see, how can I notice, how can I discern whether I am actually leaning on my own understanding or whether I'm actually trusting in the Lord? That's how we should read this passage. So this is what it says. It says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. And this is where the passage gets really hard. It says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. James' words, not mine. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, and then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we look at this, let, 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 let's just take a moment and open up our, our, our hearts and look into our hearts and see are, is my heart, is my, the way that I understand and make sense of the world defined and does it smell and look like jealousy and selfish ambition? And I'm sure off the bat, many of you guys are like, well, no, of course it doesn't. But let's just take a look in here. What, what, I mean, what is jealousy? Jealousy is us desiring what other people have. And us, if we don't get it, we sin against God so that maybe we can get it or we sin against God or we're ungrateful because we haven't got it yet. What jealousy does then is that jealousy in our hearts and our minds, it's this insidious thing that sits in the back of our head that, and it warps our hearts and our minds so that all that we do is that we just focus on what we don't have 
and we never actually focus on what we already do have. We're constantly looking at other people's popularity or their looks or their clothing or what kind of phone they have or where they're kind of at in their life, and we look at that, and it, 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 it disables us from being able to actually see that other people exist because all that we see that of other people are the things that they have or what they have that we haven't got yet. And so this, this, this when we are thinking, when, when we are kind of leaning on our own understanding, jealousy naturally comes up because all we can see is what other people, don't, what other people have and what we don't have. And then it comes to selfish ambition where our hearts and our minds, and essentially what selfish ambition is, is it's us just saying, I, I want to get what I want and I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get it, which is something that's praised and, and, and lauded in our world. And it is good to work hard, but it's not good as sinful to be selfishly ambitious. Once again, our hearts and our minds are warped by selfish ambition because all we, only, all we ever focus on is what we can get from other people instead of focusing on how we can love and care for other people. All that, we're, all that we see people as are, they're like rungs in a ladder and people are just stepping stones that we need to step over to get what we want. People then, they no longer become people, but they are just obstacles in our lives that we need to overcome in order to get what we want and to find the joy and the meaning and the purpose in our lives. Both of these totally dehumanized people, both of these entirely are focusing on self. They're inwardly focused. And these things will, will lead us astray. The, the James' words here, he doesn't hold back any punches. He says, it, to think and to live and to work in this way, to navigate through life in this way is earthly, it's unspiritual and demonic. This is no joke. If, if these things are in our heart, we need to beware and be careful because these things will lead us directly away from God. We might, we might, we might be saying, man, like, I'm, I'm not necessarily a hugely jealous person. Maybe I'm jealous every now and then. I'm not like, you know, climbing over other people to get what I want. But even the smallest version of, of that in our hearts over time can progressively lead us away from the Lord. And, and, and thinking and understanding the world through that way, leaning on our own understanding in that way is only going to separate us from other people. Once again, a lack of wisdom is, is sinful and it's eventually gonna harm us and harm other people as well. But then there's also godly wisdom that we find in this passage. It's, it's like the one glimmer of hope here. It says, but the wisdom from above, and just listen to this, this is beautiful. It says, it's first pure. <laughs> One way that you can understand that is that it, it hasn't got an angle. It's not like I'm trying to get something from you. It's, it's pure, it's, it's genuine. It says, then it's peaceable. Like we need some peace in our world <laughs> right now. And the, and the wisdom of God, it is peaceable. It, it, it rushes in to make peace instead of trying to fight with other people. It's gentle. It's open to reason. I mean, God forbid that people are open to reason or I'm open to dialogue, but godly wisdom is. It's open to reason to have a conversation, to connect with people at the level of being people, of being fellow image bearers of God. It's full of mercy, meaning that even when someone spits in your face and you have every right to do it right back to them, you say, I'm not going to. I'm not going to give you what you deserve because Jesus didn't give me what I deserved. He spared me from the punishment that I deserved on the cross. It's peaceful, it's full of mercy and good fruits. It's impartial and it is sincere, it's genuine. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so we can see pretty clearly here that earthly wisdom is just focused, laser focused on self. But godly wisdom is focused on God and focused on others. And so then how then can you and I become wise and understanding? How can we 
not lean on our own understanding like this passage in, in Proverbs 3, 5 reminds us to not lean on our own understanding. <clears throat> By ourselves, we can't. By ourselves, apart from Jesus, we're, we're, we're locked into this, this downward spiral of chasing after one more thing that we don't have and just climbing over one more person so we can get a high on the next thing that we want. And it goes down and down and down, apart from God. By ourselves, we cannot attain godly wisdom. And we need to let that sit for a moment. We even see in the book of Proverbs that it warns us against being wise in our own eyes and thinking that this earthly wisdom that we can conjure up, that this is really the way that I can get what I want in life. It warns us against that. And so the only way that you, can I, that you and I can become wise understanding is through Jesus. And Jesus is the one who shows us the path of life. And so let's go back to Proverbs chapter three and read what it says. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. You see, it's different though with Jesus because when we are with Jesus, we can actually now learn godly wisdom and we can forsake the earthly and unspiritual and demonic wisdom which enslaves us. And the only way that we can do this is because God gives us a new heart and he gives us a new mind. We're gonna spend our entire summer camp talking about this idea that, 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 that in Christ, we are now a new creation, that the old is gone, now the new has come. You see, before we knew Jesus, you and I were incapable in every way, shape, and form from having any kind of godly wisdom. But now, when we place faith in Jesus and what he has done for us, that he is who he said he is, that he's God, and that he went to the cross and died for our sins there, only through when we place faith in that, that now then we can have a new heart, we can have a new mind. And then like, like Romans 12, one and two talks about, we, our minds and our hearts can be transformed by the renewal of our minds as we spend time in God's word and in community and in the church. We see even in passages like Ezekiel 36 that God takes away our heart of stone. Literally think of a heart of stone. It doesn't work and he gives us a heart of flesh that beats and pumps for God's glory and for his name. And so it's only when we place faith in what Jesus has done for us on the cross that you and I can be freed from earthly unspiritual wisdom and find the wisdom that we need to actually navigate through our lives. Jesus came to, sep to, to free us from foolishness. He came to be the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the, he's the word of God, the logos. If you go and read Proverbs 8, he, he is the literal wisdom of God, incarnate in the flesh, the wisdom of God made into a person. And then this person came and he laid down his life for us and took the punishment that we deserved so that we could now have and know godly wisdom and how to navigate through life. And so in a very simple, simple and abbreviated way, the way that we can do this, the way that we can begin to start on this path of understanding what is wisdom and what is knowledge and how knowledge fits into wisdom and how God can transform and change our hearts into, be, into people who are wise, it all starts with us humbling ourselves. Verse five, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In other words, when you trust in God with all of your heart, there's nothing more of your heart to trust in anything else. And so you're not leaning on yourself, you're leaning on the Lord. And that requires humility. It requires us to say, God, you are God and I am not. It starts there every single day of our lives saying, God, you are God and I am not. I need your wisdom, not my wisdom. I think another natural step in that is that it turns to thankfulness, gratitude. It says, verse six, in all of your ways, not in some of your ways or when you feel like it, 
but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. And so we give thanks to God for all that he has given us. And I get it, our lives, we've all been dealt different cards. We've all experienced different joys and different pains. And not all of our, some of our lives are more comfortable than other people's lives. But you're alive here today in this room. God has been really good and really gracious to you. And I know that there's some hard things going on in your guys' life but God has not given up on you. He has not failed you. He has not forsaken you. And those things can well our hearts up in gratitude and thankfulness to God that we can say, you know what, God? Yes, I will acknowledge you in everything that I do because the only reason why I'm walking is because it's your breath in my lungs and in my body. You're the only one who is holding my life together. And when we do this, God makes our paths straight. And so as God leads us down the way, the truth, and the life, then we respond and we discipline our hearts and our lives. We, we say, I'm, I'm going to commit to developing habits in my life that get me constantly to have time and to spend time with the Lord. And so, finally, let's come back to the first question that I asked about how then can we be wise within how we use our time this summer? Taking into account all of these things. How can we be wise with how we use all this new free time that we have this summer? And I'm sure like you can see, there's probably many ways this summer that you could spend time focusing on yourself. But is that wise? Is it best? And so I, I just want you for a moment to, to imagine. Imagine if this summer was the summer that your spiritual life changed. Imagine if this summer was the summer where your faith stopped being something that your parents brought you to, that they bring you to on a Wednesday night or on a Sunday morning, but your faith became your own. Imagine if this was the summer that you really started reading your Bible, or imagine if this was the summer that you really began to pray and to begin to have an intimate relationship with God where you are acknowledging him in all of your ways. Imagine if. That would be amazing, not, not just for, for, for me, but for you. I, this, is, this is for you that your heart, that your life, that your faith would be strengthened and enriched. And I'm saying, guys, there, there, there are three months ahead of you in which that is a very real possibility if you decide to navigate through your summer with wisdom. And, 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 and here's the reality. Some of you might say, hey, like, I'm not interested in that. It doesn't mean it's the last chance. It just means that maybe that opportunity is gonna come at another time. But I wanna say, imagine if this summer, right now, walking through Come walking out of these doors back into the rest of your week and the end of your, of your school year, that something changed in your heart. And so in this, I, I realize that the prospect of your life changing completely is probably a daunting one, and I don't want you to do it alone. None of the leaders in this room want you to do it alone. That's why we have life groups. That's why we gather together. It's why we, God has gifted us with this thing called the church because in the church, God makes known his manifold wisdom. And so I wanna invite you to commit to a couple of things. First, I want to invite you to commit to being here. As you guys walked in, you probably saw that we have our, our new summer calendar. It's this orange thing. We're gonna be here every single Wednesday. And we're either gonna be opening up God's word and worshiping God through song, or we're gonna be doing some kind of fun activity. And this is not some kind of marketing ploy for me to be like, please come to my student ministry, I'm so lonely. Like, that's not what this is. This is about, this is about me saying, the way that we stay connected to the lifeblood of what God is doing and what he's doing in our community and our churches when we gather together, and so even though all your school schedule and all those things are gonna change, make this the one thing that doesn't change this summer. That you say, okay, 
Wednesdays, 7 o'clock, or sometimes on 6 p.m., that's what some of the dates, uh, what some of the times are, that I'm going to be here, and I'm going to commit to being here. And the second thing that I want to invite you to is I want you, I want to invite you to essentially to commit to reading the Bible, reading the Word of God. And you might say, I don't even know where to start. That's great. We've already planned it for you. We have Bible reading plans that you can do, that we would love to walk through them with you. And I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it now. If, if you want to commit to reading the Bible and you're like, I don't want to do it by myself, let me know and I'll meet with you on occasion every couple of weeks and we can talk about what you're learning and what God is showing you in the word. Free option, email hsm at chcbw.org and Hannah will set up a time for us to meet. Open invitation, because I, because I, I, I know sometimes be, getting into the word is a daunting thing, especially when we're doing it by ourselves. But we can do this together and this could be the summer. Imagine if, if this could be the summer that your spiritual life changes forever. Imagine if that's what it could be. And so friends, I think that's how we can navigate through our summer with wisdom. That we can not just have knowledge about this God who's in the sky that we read about in the Bible, but that we can grow into wisdom and have a relationship with God. And that's what I want to invite you guys into this summer as we get ready to, I know your classes are ending and your senioritis for your seniors is kicking in. Or if you're like junior, you're like, I, I have like early senioritis. I just don't want to get done with all my classes. Uh, and I'm sure all of you guys are like, dude, like I'm just going to throw my laptop against the wall once all these classes get done because you're so tired of Zoom. I get it. Um, but as all these things change, I want to invite you into this this summer. And, and one of the ways that one of the ways that's going to look like this summer is that we're going to be doing a sermon series in the next couple of weeks called "This Is for Everyone." And the whole point of this sermon series is that we're we're taking these snapshots of Jesus' interactions with different people in the Gospels and showing how Jesus and a relationship with God is for everyone. It's for the skeptic. It's for the anxious. It's for the hurting. It's for the innocent. It's for, it's for some of you who are like, dude, like, I haven't actually sinned that badly, but like, I get I'm still a sinner, but like, what, like, Jesus is for everyone. And we want to invite you into that. And we want to invite you to invite your friends into that, that they might also see that Jesus is, this is for what, this is for everyone, that what we're doing here, this is for everyone. And so friends, let's just close our time here in prayer. If you have any questions or any concerns, or if I haven't met you because I've like, the mask has come off and now I realize I know like none of you. Um, so if you would like to meet me or I would like to meet you, I'm extending it. So if you, would, if you feel mutually, then cool, let's hang out. I'll be right here. Um, I would love to meet you uh, and, and get to know you a little bit and just to hear about why you're here. Um, or if you're saying like, man, like I want to have, I want to know what it means to have godly wisdom and I don't, I don't have a relationship with Jesus and I want to know that. I'd love to have a conversation with, with, with you about that as well. But let's pray and then you guys are going to be free to go. Father, we give you thanks that you have not, you've not left us in the dark without wisdom or understanding. You've sent your son, Jesus. You, you, you paid the highest price so that we would no longer have to be enslaved to jealousy or selfish ambition or foolishness. But now through your son, Jesus, we can find real hope, real wisdom, and understanding of how to navigate through our lives. Father, I pray that you would bless these students as they wrap up their school year. Father, we know that finals are the worst. Um, and we just pray, I pray, Father, that somehow you would give them supernatural ability in their minds as they study and they try and remember or as they cram all these things that they've forgotten the rest of the year into their, into their minds right here at the, these last couple weeks of school. Father, please be with them. Father, give them grace as they, as they sit, for many of them, in, on, for many hours a day looking at a Zoom screen and, and doing classwork. Father, give them grace and focus. Father, most of all, I just pray that you would stir up in the hearts of our students a desire to, to commit to, to being here and to commit to being in your word this summer. So Father, we pray all of these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you guys for your attention this evening. Hang out till we kick you out. You guys are dismissed.